The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. When Judas had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and in him God is glorified. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. You will seek me. And as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men you will, will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The Gospel of the Lord. For those of the Gospel of our sins be pointed out. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb from the Revelation to John. Today we continue our sermon series, this Paschal journey through this book of Revelation. Remember, in past weeks, John the Apostle was given a vision by Christ. He was allowed to peek through an open door into heaven and see the worship that takes place there. The slain and risen Lamb of God, reigning from the throne of God. And only he is worthy to open up the seven seals of the sacred scroll. And so as the Lamb begins to open the seals one by one, supernatural things begin to happen with the opening of each seal. And all of them show the impending judgment on those who persecuted the church. There's a kind of parallel to the Exodus story here, where once upon a time, growing plagues upon Egypt led up to the liberation of God's people, and the blood of the Paschal Lamb spared them from God's wrath. The same thing, we might say, unfolds here in John's Revelation, through seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls. And once again, it is the shed blood of the Paschal Lamb that guarantees salvation and sees God's people through times of judgment. Now we've skipped ahead several chapters, from chapter 7 all the way to the crescendo in chapter 19. The plagues of God's judgment are being poured out on the Roman Empire, symbolically called Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. The wrath of the Lamb is poured out on those who persecuted the saints. Throughout Revelation, we see this ongoing mockery and parody of God, you might notice, by the forces of darkness. Now, Satan has always tried to mock God. He tried to take God's place. In Revelation, there's a kind of dark counterpart and counterfeit Godhead. As the vision unfolds, we see a a parallel demonic trinity, of Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. The devil first rebelled, of course, by trying to replace God, and we see that effort come to a head at the end of history. Just as there is a counterfeit trinity, there's, we might say, a counterfeit church. On the one side, we have the whore of Babylon, the harlot who rides the beast, wears scarlet, and is drunk on the blood of the saints. On the other side, we have the church, the triumphant bride of Christ, made ready for her husband, washed pure in the blood of the Lamb, dressed in garments of white, woven with fine linen, the threads of which are the righteous deeds of the saints. She will have the final victory over her persecutor. In the world today, you may feel very out of step, out of place, behind the times. And there is a counterfeit out there, a kind of counterfeit community, a counterfeit morality, a counterfeit sacramental system. Don't fall for the counterfeit. God wants us to see in advance that its, destru- that its end is destruction, that the victory belongs to the Lamb and to those who are faithful to Him. Those who persevere to the end will be saved. 
There's great triumph and rejoicing in heaven when Babylon falls. And that's where we pick up the story in chapter 19. After this, I heard what seemed to be the mighty voice of a great multitude in heaven crying, Alleluia! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. And then our reading actually skips down a few verses, so we get the explanation, why all the rejoicing? John continued, for God's judgments are true and just. He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication, and he has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And then twenty-four elders and four living creatures fell down and worshipped God seated on the throne. There's no doubt here the punishment of the wicked results in further joy and praise in heaven's victory celebration. In our modern world, these hallelujahs seem a little out of place. Even though the enemy defeated is a satanic enemy, it perhaps strikes us as a bit too harsh, out of place, almost barbaric. I think there are basically two reasons why we react this way. The first is that none of us has really known persecution and suffering. Not like this, not like the early Christians, not like others in part of the world today. It continues in various places, but we don't know it here. You've never been fired for your faith, had your church or home burned to the ground, had your pastor or your family members beheaded or crucified in front of you. Sometimes we talk about feeling persecuted for our faith or our when our feelings are hurt or we're embarrassed or ostracized for our religious beliefs, but we don't know real suffering like the martyrs did. None of us have been tortured and killed for the name of Christ. None of us have been stabbed, had our limbs cut off, our eyes gouged out, nails driven through our flesh, branded or burned or skin flayed, eaten by animals. Those are all things that happened to the martyrs. Until we come to that point, we really have no right to judge their joy over justice being served. Justice inherently involves retribution, a counterbalance to set things right. Even the psalmist of Psalm 137 wrote, Happy shall he be who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rock. That is, how lucky the one who gets to be vindicated, who lives to see that, who sees the guilty pay for their horrible crimes. The second reason why we have an uncomfortable reaction to these passages is that we simply do not lo any longer comprehend the gravity of sin. What does it say about us that it's no longer the sin itself that makes us uncomfortable that turns our stomach? It's rather the punishment of sin that does this to us. Sin is the worst thing in existence. It ruins the lives of real people whom God loves. And it's a good thing when sin is destroyed. But if we think that that was the only or even the primary cause of rejoicing in heaven, we would be misled or misinformed. There is far more than that. In fact, all these seven bowls of wrath and judgment being poured out are only to make way to clear the house for the glorious matrimonial celebration. Revelation, the book of Revelation, is not so much about Armageddon. If we think that, we've kind of missed the point. It's about a wedding, a marriage made in heaven for a new earth. One of the early church fathers, Ecumenius, noted, in the present age, the marriage of the Lord with the church is still in the state of courtship, and is not yet a consummated marriage. And then he points to St. Paul's explanation in 2 Corinthians 11:2, where he wrote, I betrothed you to Christ to present you as a pure bride to her one husband. And so Ecumenius explains, we are in a time of courtship, and we receive the pledge of the Spirit as a sign of our courtship. However, when the church becomes one spirit with Christ, as a husband becomes one body with his wife, then the marriage will be perfected. That's why John tells us that the saints and the angels in heaven are rejoicing. 
The time has come for the Lord to return to his church like a, gr- like a groom coming to marry his bride. And so the celebration has begun. We're not quite to the wedding yet, but all is being prepared. We'll get there in the last two chapters, these next two Sundays. Until then, let's leave with this thought. John tells that an angel didn't just say, but told him to write down. And it's always very important when you need to write something down. He said, write, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And John tells us, he said to me, these are true words of God. And that's you and me. We are blessed indeed. May God help us to appreciate this blessed invitation to the marriage supper of the Paschal Lamb and to be the pure bride that he is preparing for himself. Now to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins and made us a kingdom, priest to serve as God and Father, To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen.